Leanne, and hello everyone. It's it's a pleasure to be here today to help moderate the session and to join some ACGC members to learn more about innovative finance and, and some of the different actors in this space. Um, before starting, I would like to acknowledge that I live on Treaty 1 territory, which is the traditional territory of the Ashinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. It's also known as Winnipeg. So just a few housekeeping notes for participants, uh, participants on the webinar today. So there is some tech support available uh, named ACGC tech support. Uh, if you need assistance um, to nav navigate to the panelist section and send the tech support uh, private chat, um, please feel free to participate by leaving some comments in the chat to all function. And if you have questions for the panelists, uh, please use the, Q uh, the question and answer section below. And we hope to get to a couple of those questions uh, by the end of the session today. And please remember to remain respectful in your comments and questions. ACGC has a zero tolerance for hate speech and harassment um, and wish uh, for the conference to make, remain a safe uh, space for everyone involved. And finally, um, just follow the conversation on Twitter, tweet at hashtag ACGC trailblazing. And on that note, uh, let's begin. Um, so innovative financing is on the rise in global development discourse, and it covers various approaches to raising funds or stimulating actions in support of international development that go beyond traditional spending approaches. More than ever before, uh, in today, more than ever before. So in today's world where global challenges are increasingly more complex and protracted, creative and innovative ways of financing development projects, partnering with civil society, private and public actors in Canada and abroad are necessary. So our panelists today have been innovating, researching and implementing in the development finance space. We're excited to hear from them, where the world of development finance is headed, what is being done differently by actors in this space, which has given rise to the term innovative financing and any cautions we should be taking as we move forward with these new funding modalities. So I know we have a, a condensed time together today. So I'd like to start by welcoming our first panelist, Cam Do, who is the new Director General at Global Affairs Canada, leading the Innovative and Climate Finance Bureau, and was the former Executive Director for uh, climate, the Climate Finance Team since 2019. In that role, she was responsible for leading and delivering on Canada's 5.3 billion climate fin finance commitments. So welcome, Cam. Um, so um, just to, I'll jump into the question, at the 2021 G7 Leader Summit, Canada announced a doubling of its international climate finance commitment to 5.3 billion over the next five years. Um, so can you tell us what is Global Affairs Canada doing to drive financial innovation in finding solutions to the global climate crisis? The global climate crisis, and how is Canada leveraging the development and the climate impact of small and medium enterprises in developing markets? Thank you so much, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for inviting me to uh, participate in this panel. It's always very exciting to uh, to speak to people from Edmonton because that's actually my hometown. So. Um, but before I start, let me also acknowledge that I'm speaking from the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Chisleiwatut peoples. So I'm currently in Vancouver, uh, but I'm based out of Ottawa. Um, but here in BC, I'm experiencing what I think is unseasonably warm fall weather. It's almost, uh, I think it's over 20 degrees today. Um, and this unusual weather is because of climate change, right? So with climate change, heat waves are becoming more frequent as we saw over the summer in Alberta, BC and Saskatchewan. And according to the latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report, warm spells and heat waves have increased since the mid 20th century with no signs of stopping. So what does this mean? It means that we need to take action and it, all, it also means that we need to do things differently. So this leads me to today's topic innovative financing for international development. So in simpler terms, you know, what does that mean, right? It means these are financial tools that are used by public, private, and philanthropic uh, investors to fight the effects of climate change. So I believe that donor countries, including Canada, 
need to use their development assistance in a targeted way to de-risk investment opportunities and catalyze private sector investments for climate action. So I'm gonna focus my comments on three main issues today. The first one is Canada's new climate um, finance commitment, the underlying policy framework, um, and finally, how we're actually supporting the private sector, especially uh, SMEs. So as Christina mentioned, we did double to 5.3 billion in 2021 from 2.65. And this five-year commitment supports developing countries as they combat climate change, while also striving to address biodiversity loss around the world. And the goal really is to help low and middle income countries already affected by climate change to transition to sustainable, low carbon, climate resilient, nature positive and inclusive development. Yes, we're trying to do everything, right? That's what we do in government. But simply put, what we're trying to do, this means that we're trying to live in harmony with nature and preserve its life giving resources for generations to come. Secondly, Canada's commitment is uh, divided into four thematic areas. Uh, and these were chosen following consultations that we did in the summer of 2020 across Canada. I think we received over 200 submissions. And the four key areas are clean energy and coal phase out, climate smart agriculture and food systems, nature-based solutions and biodiversity, and finally, climate governance. And as I mentioned, this commitment is also guided by three targets. We didn't have targets before, we do now because we recognize that we actually need to have a goal to reach. So the first one is we've increased our funding to adaptation to 40%. That's because we do recognize that we need to help countries to really adapt to the impacts of um, climate change. Second goal, and this goal here reflects Canada's own um, feminist international assistance policy, and that's at least 80% of projects will integrate gender equality. And this policy really recognizes that supporting gender equality is among the most effective ways to help address the root causes of poverty and also build a more prosperous and inclusive world. And lastly, this the last target is a minimum of 20% of our funding, that's over a billion dollars, will support nature-based solutions and projects with uh, biodiversity co-benefits. So I'm really happy to see this target. It's a challenging target for us because many of our partners have told us this is not the space we work in. This is not where Canadian expertise lies. But it recognizes that climate change is one of the key drivers for biodiversity and we need to protect, conserve and restore biodiversity. So that's a lot of information, but we do have a public website that is uh, available and that outlines all of our um, thematic areas. Lastly, you may be wondering, what does this even mean for you, right? And for the private sector in general. So for us, Canada recognizes the important part that the private sector needs to play in responding to climate change in developing countries. So moving from the billions to the trillions that's needed to meet the sustainable development goals, this demands investments from both public and private resources. But we know that private, private investors are really reluctant to invest in climate related projects in developing countries because of the perceived or actual risks that they actually see. So that's why as part of Canada's financial toolkit, we provide concessional or what we call low interest, long tenor, long grace period loans, loans in developing countries. So this really helps new streams of financing from private sector partners by entering new markets or countries in partnership with governments, right? Other government donors, and it also helps to reduce the risk of doing it alone, going in by yourself. So we've established many different relationships with multilateral development banks, like the World Bank, the African Development Bank, and we provided funding in the billions of dollars to help overcome market barriers and facilitate private capital investments. And these funds also support SMEs in developing countries. So for example, we have a fund called the Canada Climate Fund for the Americas, what's known as the C2F. 
It's a $250 million loan facility from Canada that aims to bring private sector investments to climate projects across Latin America and the Caribbean. And as part of this fund, they've, they, we've provided 20 million US dollars to a national bank in Colombia, which then on lends to SMEs, including women-led SMEs. So this funding is used to promote environmentally friendly businesses. So in addition, uh, the C2F is one of our first partners that's piloted innovative ways to incorporate gender into their private sector projects. So what they've done is they've developed a performance incentive based program to incentivize private sector actors to integrate gender considerations into all of their operations. So for this Colombian bank, they will actually see a reduction in their interest rate paid once they achieve those um, performance indicators in their, um, in their loan agreement. So we're really happy to see this effort and we see that it doesn't have to mean sacrificing climate results or private sector development. So in fact, uh, as of last year, just uh, December of last year, the C2F has leveraged almost 900 million US dollars in private sector resources. And through the over 20 projects um, in the region, they've also abated 4.6 million tons of CO2 and produced 9.1 million megawatts of renewable energy. So what does that mean? It means that we've also, it's equivalent to removing almost a million cars, gas powered cars off the road and heating almost 500,000 homes. So half the population of Edmonton. So I think that's great for $250 million. Um, GAC also has a sister program called the International Assistance Innovation Program and Serge and knows it quite well. <laughs> uh, it's called the IAIP. And this program requires that the majority of its funding to be repaid. So very similar to the climate finance program. And it doesn't typically support standalone non-repayable initiatives or what we got call grants and contributions. So under this program, GAC seeks to partner primarily with experienced private sector actors to mobilize additional capital for the SDGs. And like the climate finance program, it's also looking to work with pro partners that have a proven relevant track record and risk management experience, in addition to sufficient financial holding relative to the proposed investments that they're putting forward. So through this program, we've also committed like 300 million to initiatives that support climate smart agriculture, infrastructure, and financing for SMEs and gender lens investing. So all of these facilities that I've talked about really blend both the public, so our money, and private resources. And Canada really has become a pioneer in blended finance. And we've learned along the way. We've made mistakes, but we've also learned along the way. We really remain committed to this approach, given the urgency of climate and development challenges the world is facing. And we also see that other donors are coming alongside us and are learning and taking what we've learned to adapt to their own funding. So together, we're all learning how to best use this blended finance tool, right? But I'd also like to turn to all of you and ask, is it working? because we continue to hear from developing partners and countries that there are issues of access to finance, that the money that we're providing doesn't reach the poorest of the poorest, and that the climate crisis is worsening and they need more financing. So I know that there are lots and lots of opportunities to continue to improve, and I welcome comments and suggestions. So I welcome really this type of um, conversation to help us uh, refine. Um, so to conclude, I do believe that Canada is setting the standard for how to de-risk investment opportunities and catalyze private sector investments in developing countries using our development assistance. So we do see this as a clear demonstration that we're bringing together public and private resources that can deliver results for climate change, gender equality, and development. Um, I know that's a lot of information, so I'm happy to answer any questions afterwards. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Cam. That was uh, a lot of information, but great information. Um, I, I liked your your comment here about um, um, are we actually are, are you know th there's lots of gaps perhaps to fill, and I think that might be a question we'll save for the end um, because I know a lot of the members of ACGC are um, from civil society and small organizations, and they may have a question around that. So if we have some time, we'll get to that a bit later. But thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to continue um, and move on uh, to welcome Jessica Villanueva. Jessica, uh, she's our next panelist. So she is a senior director of technical areas of practice at MEDA. She has more than 20 years of management experience with emphasis on agri-food market systems, financial inclusion programs, and gender smart, environmentally and socially responsible impact investment projects in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Um, so MEDA uses an economic development approach to build and enhance sustainable agri-food systems by empowering entrepreneurs and farmers to build profitable businesses and livelihoods. So welcome, Jessica. And my question for you, or a um, couple of questions for you is, what is it about MEDA's financing model and strategy that enables it to reach communities, women, girls, and the most vulnerable in communities? And secondly, how does MEDA's model leverage already existing local knowledge and expertise? Thank you. Thank you, Christina. And hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here with you all. And thank you so much to the Alberta Council for Global Cooperation for the invitation to share about MIDA. So for those who don't know MIDA, MIDA is an international economic development organization founded in 1953 by a group of Mennonite entrepreneurs whose mission is to create business solutions to poverty in agri-food market systems. MIDA believes that all people deserve the opportunity to earn livelihoods and that unleashing entrepreneurship is a powerful way to alleviate poverty. MIDA's goal is to create and sustain decent work for 500,000 women, men, and youth by 2030. At MIDA, we recognize that the challenges to achieve this ambitious goal are systemic in nature, they are complex and there are interconnected global issues with multiple contributing factors. We recognize that the world is in a moment where we need to rethink how we do business in this rapidly changing landscape. And our MIDAS organizational strategy is focused on doing business differently in the global south. We use a triple impact approach that includes economic, social and environmental considerations and a systems lens that help us to identify bottlenecks, blind spots, and weaknesses, and the best ways to channel multiple forms of business support and capital to where it can create the most equitable and sustainable returns while facilitating transformative change. MIDA seeks to shift the traditional financial models to remove barriers in the agri-food system and to be creative in the way we deploy capital, establish partnerships, and provide access to finance. MIDA's financing model includes an integrated approach to ensure alignment between finance and our programming. MIDA brings our own capital through the MIDA Risk Capital Fund to ensure that the entrepreneurs we work with have access to the resources required to grow their businesses and create decent work. And it's an honor to share this panel with uh, Serge because Sarona is a key partner for, for MIDA. They are the, the fund advisor for this MIDA Risk Capital Fund and they, they are critical in the work uh, we do. Capital is only a tool that we leverage within our agri-food market systems programming to shift power dynamics in the markets, making them more stable and equitable. How we do this? Uh, we do this by improving success of women entrepreneurs in their own ecosystems. Through our market assessments, we try to understand the power dynamics within the specific markets and the entrepreneurship ecosystem. The finance industry wants women-led businesses to be the ones to change. Our financing model is trying to change the thinking and using a different approach. We're testing a model that we don't need to fix the businesses. We need to fix how the capital is provided. 
we are working with the businesses to make changes so that they are eligible for financing while working with the financial partners to adjust their processes and strategies on how they are engaging and assessing businesses, especially women-led businesses. Our financing model considers more than just business, per business performance. It takes into account the additional factors that affect women, such as gender-based violence and care work. Finance can make a change in women-led businesses, but only if these factors that hold women back are considered as central part for the financial decisions. For example, in Africa, women own half of the companies, but many are informal. And this means that they are more vulnerable to shocks, climate change, recessions, or the current pandemic. 60% of these women are in agriculture, one of the hardest hit sectors, but also one of the most important to support for long-term food security. Companies owned by men have access to six times the investment capital to those owned by women. This power analysis helps us to understand how to deploy our capital. We ask ourselves, what needs can capital address and what else is needed for capital to be most impactful? MIDA uses finance as a way to catalyze change in the system where a women entrepreneur operates, not just individual enterprises. MIDA's proposition is to have an integrated approach and we invite all stakeholders to understand the power dynamics within the ecosystem and what levers can be used to create change. Recognizing that on the ground teams and MIDA's local partners have deep knowledge of how markets work including the ways that finance can address the barriers within these markets. We reinforce in our partnerships the need to translate this knowledge into an ability to analyze gender equality and environmental issues in markets and identify how they are hampering market potential and fuel inequities and how the power of finance can support the shifts needed to make the market work. We are using this power of this knowledge to push how the financial intermediaries are assessing the companies and providing capital that is responding to their needs. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Jessica. Uh, I, one a few of your comments struck me. One being that you're you're not looking at um, how to improve the businesses, but you're really looking at the power dynamics. Um, so that's something maybe we can get into later if there is time for another question. But something I think a, a number of funds are looking at uh, that might be a bit more traditional funding models. So thank you for that. Um, so I would like to now um, introduce and welcome um, our next panelist, Serge Levard Chiasson. Serge is the managing partner of Serona Asset Management, and Serge, Serge's accountabilities include Serona's strategy and operations, including finance, legal, compliance, and the impact mandate. So Serona's expertise is in investing in private companies in emerging markets, focusing on lower mid-market companies that serve the rising middle class, Serona invests both directly and through local funds and intermediaries and focuses on strong financial returns and social environmental impact. So Serge, um, I will, um, I've got a few questions here for you. I'll read them all out and I'll, I'll let you kind of respond here. Um, so what makes the Serona investment model different from traditional ODA or investment approaches? And what gaps in traditional funding approaches does this model address? And finally, what partnerships in Canada and abroad are key to making Serona model work and be sustainable? So it's a lot. If you need me to repeat a question at some point, just let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Christina. Yeah, we had a chance to quickly talk about some of this yesterday. So hopefully some of those uh, conversation pieces come, comes, come out through the, the panel today. Uh, thanks again for inviting me to to speak today and, and also to uh, see so many familiar faces uh, on this panel. Um, yeah, just briefly before I, I answer some of the questions that probably important for those of, of you who have not heard of Serona, just to give you a bit of background. I think that'll help with understanding some of my responses to the questions. Uh, here at Serona, we use impact investing as a tool for development. 
Uh, today, we manage approximately 450 million Canadian, and we've reached that goal of, of, of raising that money from 300, over 300 private and public investors, mostly private, uh, who are quite interested in our work in impact investing, focused on gender lens and climate finance outcomes in global emerging markets. Uh, I'll just briefly share our, our vision so that people can better understand what we seek to do, which is um, at Serona, we envision a future where impact investing at scale builds inclusive communities thriving on a healthy earth. I think for many of you, you probably see some, um, some things akin to maybe some of your day-to-day -day work, and we'd love to figure out a way so that we can work together on, on some of these uh, vision statements that we've uh, put together at Serona. Um, just to make it a bit more concrete, because often people say, okay, that's all sounds good, but what do you do in your day-to-day? -day? Uh, we do have three product streams, so it's probably important for you to understand our work. Uh, first, we manage and deliver impact investment strategies, mostly through what's called in the business a fund-to-fund -fund approach. So we focus on private funds that are mostly locally managed, and we also sometimes invest direct in co-investments alongside those funds. We do target strong financial returns. Our investors are interested in investing for impact, but ultimately um, compare us to the rest of their portfolio, which may have less of an impact orientation. Um, in addition to that, uh, we do have a second product stream, which is these impact mandates. Uh, Jessica shared one of them, the Meta Risk Capital Fund which we're quite proud of, of working with Mita on. In addition to that, though, we, we were also selected uh, to manage the Government of Australia's em Emerging Markets Impact Investment Fund, which is focused on impact investment funds, particularly with a gender lens approach in Southeast Asia and the Pacific. And then third, um, we've just begun offering a customized shared service uh, offering, which allows our partners to scale. And maybe just to explain a little bit why we decided to do that, our theory of change is really focused on making impact investors better at what they do. And we found that uh, many new fund managers in particular face some pretty significant barriers of getting uh, themselves and their funds off the ground. And Serona, with his 12 years of experience and having worked with over 1,200 funds in emerging markets, finds that uh, it can really bring some really valuable insights and, and support for those funds. So going now into the questions, um, the work we do, um, not to quote a biblical example here, but the work we do really is about teaching, uh, teaching a person to fish rather than giving a fish away. It's really built on a premise that supporting economic, sustainable economic development uh, will result in helping uh, build more sustainable jobs and more sustainable economic development. This will likely, and, and has been our experience, result in direct and indirect economic benefits to local populations. Uh, that includes a bunch of different things. And, and one of those things is the, the uh, expansion of the breadth and depth of products and services offered by local SMEs for the local communities. And that also supports local suppliers, which we uh, take great pride in, in, in gathering impact data on an annual basis to, to demonstrate some of this work. Uh, these businesses, in, in turn, they do scale and, and do pay uh, employee sales and corporate taxes, which provide much needed resources for local governments to enable social and uh, hard infrastructure investments in their communities. Uh, Serona does believe and, and, and it has been able to demonstrate that in, 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 in investing with impact at scale is, is truly necessary to, to achieve our vision of developing more inclusive community and a thriving earth. Um, so with that in mind, I think you can really see the role that impact investment can play as part of a development toolkit. It's not the be in and all uh, in terms of solution pathways, but it is one tool that one needs to be able to demonstrate long-term sustainable economic growth that empowers local communities to solve their own problems over time. So maybe Christina, I'll pause there because I suspect there's May, there may be some questions from the audience or, or other comments from the other panelists as well to, to share before we go on. Sure, if another panelist does have a comment, I'm happy to take that right now. We do have a few minutes to offer that. Um, I would say for me, I'm kind of interested in, in um, it's interesting that you mentioned localization being a focus and focusing not just on local SMEs, but also on suppliers. Um, I, I also, what a comment that struck me was about um, your, your uh, the financiers, I guess, or the, the companies wanting to get a return on investment. And I, I wonder if um, 
uh, some of those uh, investors think about um, uh, if they're able to get that sort of a, a financing model for the return on social investment. So is there, um, is there a return on that that they can quantify um, that helps them invest in projects? Um, so I, you don't necessarily have to answer that now, but um, if there are some questions from the panelists um, uh, or comments from the panelists, I'd be happy to hear them too. Well, maybe I'll just, I'll just quickly give, give a couple of thoughts. Uh, yes, absolutely. There are different types of investors in, in our market as well as in the general market. Some uh, tend to uh, put more weight in the impact of the investment and less on the returns, while others, um, you know, for obvious reasons, will put more weight on the financial returns and be very happy with the impact, but it's more of a derivative of their overall strategy. Uh, we need both. The reality, and, and Cam mentioned that in her comments, is in order to scale and to bring more capital into things that are publicly good, like climate finance or gender lens investing or investing in local communities, sometimes um, there are investors like governments, but also philanthropic capital that can also bridge that gap. And, and that's the term that Cam used, the blended finance approach, which can sometimes uh, act as a catalyst to bring money that um, would be, say, more focused on financial returns, blending with uh, capital that may not be uh, as sensitive to those commercial return attributes. And the blending of those two can get projects off the ground and, and, and perhaps get some commercial investors off the sidelines. Um, but I'll probably say <laughs> enough on the topic, but that's been our experience that, that those two types of funding are actually quite critical particularly in emerging markets, to get capital to, to play in the impact investment space. Thank you, Selsh. Um, if another panelist did want to comment, I have a couple of minutes before we introduce Susan, our final panelist. <laughs> if not, we can also address this later. So if anyone had a comment, feel free to pop on quickly on video. Susan, did you have a question before I introduce you formally or no? Okay. Or a comment. Okay, well then I'll just I'll introduce Susan, and then if um, if there are some comments later and we have some time, we'll we'll take it from there. Um, so finally, welcome to Susan Spronk. Um, Susan teaches at the School of International Development and Global Studies at Ottawa U. She is a co-founder of the Blended Finance Project, a coalition of concerned civil society organizations, unions, and academics who wish to provide Canadians with a more complete picture of blended finance and Canadian Official Development Aid, or ODA. So Susan, um, I think you're going to come at this maybe from a bit of a different angle, so that will be an interesting perspective to get. Maybe you can um, first explain briefly what a blended finance model is, and what are the strengths of a blended finance model? Where is it headed? And what should we be cautious about as we move forward with all of these funding models that we've been hearing about today? Great, thank you very much. And it's great to be here. I'm joining you from the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people, or otherwise known as Ottawa. Um, so it's really great to be here as well because I am from Edmonton and I cut my teeth as a development practitioner uh, working with Change for Children, actually, which is one of the member organizations of the Alberta Council. And Hank Zip, who was the founder of that organization, had a saying, which was, it's not just about giving a fish or teaching a person to fish, which is better than giving a fish away. It's also about who owns the boats and who like hires the workers and who also owns the territory in which you are doing the fishing, especially with contamination of the water. So I think part of what I'm gonna say is really about this bigger picture about where blended finance fits in, in a larger scope. Uh, and also to raise some cautions and concerns while recognizing that I think we've heard uh, a lot from our other panelists about some of the exciting possibilities that also exist in certain sectors. And so I think one of the questions that we can ask is about, is this kind of tool appropriate for all sectors? And I will suggest no. And before starting, I'd also like to reflect that I feel like blended finance and all the excitement around blended finance reminds me about the excitement of um, microfinance, which in the 1990s, of course, was also uh, a caught, attracted a lot of attention, Nobel Prize winning, Grameen Bank. 
Um, but then after 30 years of practice, we've seen how, yes, microfinance is a very appropriate instrument at a certain scale. It can do a lot for, for people in low income communities, but it's also morphed into something that traps people into debt. And so I think we're going to face some similar questions, or I want to put those questions out now, but where are we going to be? Because Canada is a bit of a late player in the game. And I think Cam acknowledged this when Cam noted that uh, Canada, as of about 2017, really started talking about blended finance, uh, created some new instruments to start to promote blended finance, including uh, the finance FinDev, which is based in Montreal and under the auspices of Export Development Canada. So it's not you know, formally part of the ODA package, uh, but Canada has been participating in many of the blended finance initiatives at the global level. So one of the questions I was asked to answer is, who are the actors in blended finance? And yes, there are some NGOs involved. Uh, Canadian NGOs are also involved. The World Wildlife Fund is one, so uh, Children's Villages, uh, some of the larger NGOs. But I think one of the questions that you mentioned already, Christina, is about what is this going to mean for the smaller NGOs? Like, is this the kind of instrument that other smaller organizations are going to be able to access? So the big players in blended finance are the large investment firms at the global level, transnational corporations such as BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street. Uh, there are also some development finance institutions such as the Dutch uh, Entrepreneurial Development Bank. And certainly uh, the World Bank has really been pushing this agenda through its maximizing finance for development, uh, the billions to trillions that was already mentioned. In terms of what blended finance is, I think it's been defined a couple of times, which is the use of public monies, so that's taxpayer money, in order to leverage this money by de-risking the investments of, of private actors. So certainly there are strengths and there's no doubt and here I'm going to draw from Oxfam's work. Oxfam's done a lot of work on the questions of blending and asking questions about what do we need in place to actually uh, make sure that this investment or this mechanism for delivering ODA can actually deliver the results of leaving no one behind. And they write in a paper uh, called Faith is Not Enough in 2019 that the private sector and private finance can, in the right context and with the right regulatory framework, make important contributions to sustainable developments and the reduction of inequalities, including gender inequality, by stimulating decent jobs and livelihoods, by catalyzing innovation, and by paying taxes that enable states to deliver essential public services. So I'm going to draw attention to some of the things that we think are currently lacking. And I know the Canadian, like, we're learning in this process, it's only been about five years that Canada has been formally labeling these instruments as, as such. And I know that also uh, there's awareness of this and I think the sector as a whole is looking for ways to address some of these problems and it would be interesting to hear some of the panelists uh, response to those kinds of challenges. So I'll point to the track record of blended finance because this instrument has been used in Europe uh, for over a decade now. And it's been tracked in particular by the European Network on Debt and Development, and they've published a number of papers uh, raising critical questions about where are we going with this instrument and cautions and also uh, making proposals for reforms that we need to see for this instrument to be able to actually deliver its, on its promises. Um, so on closer examination, the results of blended finance have been rather disappointing thus far. And yes, uh, blended finance, unfortunately, uh, is not an instrument that tends to be easy to use in low income countries. According to data from the OECD from 2020, for example, I think it's around 77% went to the middle income countries, only about 7% to the less developed countries. Um, so we can see that there is, it's, it's because it's about making profit, there is a contradiction to overcome, which is how do we make the poor bankable? And that's something that's very difficult to solve. Also, money, most of the money in blending using these private sector instruments uh, goes to banking and financial services, energy and industry. And only 2% goes to water and sanitation, which is something that I've spent my career thus far looking at. And it does beg the question about those fundamental services for social equality, such as health and education, and even agriculture, where we've seen pushback from civil society on using these instruments um, in the last few years. So number two, public financing is more expensive than private, private financing is more expensive than public financing. Uh, banks that provide the financing lend to the private sector at a highest interest rate 
because the companies may not be able to secure long-term returns on investments and then uh, face considerable risk. The public sector pays lower interest rates on loans because the security of their tax revenue renders them a lower risk investment. And in fact, this is why many argue that the government is best suited to fund development initiatives. One of the things I think is a big concern uh, is that blended finance initiatives are complex and difficult to monitor. And some of the academic literature that's been emerging on blended finance and also the gray literature by international organizations points to these holes in the international regulatory system right now, where at best what we have are voluntary principles and not principles that can be followed up in a court of law. So there's problems in terms of the transparency and accountability. Um, also, as I've already mentioned, I think there are problems where public investments in health, education, water and sanitation are urgently needed, but it's difficult to provide those services for a profit, uh, especially in poor communities. And also uh, in a pol policy paper by someone named Polly Meeks, the fifth problem that I think we need to overcome or the cautions is that it is difficult to use this tool to promote gender equality. I think there is a role for uh, promoting women-led businesses, small and medium enterprises, but a review of recent blended finance initiatives suggests that 75% do not display any gender awareness at all. So again, there's gaps in the sector right now in terms of pushing forward on some of these reforms that I think we need to see. And then lastly, um, blended finance is supposed to create additionality. That is the whole, idea is that when the private sector is doing these things, it'll create other space for the public budget to address other issues and that they'll create, therefore, additional benefits. Of course, there's no universally agreed upon definition for what those things mean. Um, it's not supposed to crowd out private sector investors, but there's a high risk of impact washing. That is that partners will claim to achieve a positive benefit even when there's none or where the impact would have been achieved in any case. And so I do think we have some questions to ask about where we're going here. And I'll close with what I think the cautions are, what we need to do. And I think there's two orders of things. One is I do think we need measures to increase transparency and accountability of these initiatives. And one of the commonly referenced set of principles is the Kampala principles, which have been created by um, OECD to look at how we can use these instruments well. And also secondly, and I think this always needs to be part of the conversation is that I have other questions about, is this really an appropriate instrument if we're concerned about the poorest people in low-income countries, at least the least development countries. So I think we need to also always keep on the agenda other alternatives, including budget support, tax reform, and debt relief always need to be part of this conversation about development financing and alternatives. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Susan. <laughs> That's a lot of great information you've shared today. Um, 